Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a book review of Moby Dick. And I have been thinking about this a lot in the week since I finished Moby Dick. It has officially been a week since I finished it today. And it has been in the forefront of my mind since I finished it. And when I initially finished it, I gave it four stars because I did feel like there were some parts of it that were meandering. There were parts of it that I really, I really didn't feel like I could give five stars, but I thought in my heart, this is a five star book. Upon reflection though, the fact that the book has been in the forefront of my mind for the past seven days or so uh, has actually made me boost its rating to five stars. I rarely do individual book reviews on my channel. I feel like I should do more of them because they're really great to get a snapshot of a particular book and how you felt about that particular book immediately upon finishing it. So I hope this won't be too rambly of a review, but I do have a lot of feelings about Moby Dick and I'm hoping that we can uh, get into them here. Moby Dick is a classic that looms fairly large in the public consciousness and it's there for two very opposing reasons. On the one hand, Moby Dick is always spoken of as perhaps the greatest American novel ever written. On the other hand, you have people who think Moby Dick is absolutely terrible uh, and why are we still studying it? Why is it still being discussed? Because it is an extremely strange novel. The plot can be fairly easily summed up. Uh, we are following our narrator who is named Ishmael uh, and his goal essentially at the start of the book is to get onto a whaling expedition. Uh, he spends a night in an inn on his way to Nantucket and he meets a Pacific Islander named Queequeg there and they form a pretty intense friendship. They become friends fairly rapidly, uh, very, very good friends, and they both decide to go on the Pequod when they get to Nantucket. So this ship called the Pequod, who was captained by the most famous character other than Moby Dick, uh, Captain Ahab. Now everybody gets on board the ship, they think they're going out for a regular whaling expedition that will take place over maybe a couple of years. Uh, but as soon as they are out of port, as soon as they are essentially out of the side of land, Captain Ahab reveals to them that this is not really gonna be a normal whaling expedition. This is a revenge mission because Ahab wants in particular to target and track down the white whale Moby Dick. The reason Ahab is so angry at this particular whale is because on a previous voyage, he lost his leg to Moby Dick. And on the surface, that's a pretty straightforward plot that seems uh, really fun and engaging and a little bit adventurous, a little bit like Jaws. In fact, there's quite a bit of Jaws in this. If you are very familiar uh, with the film or with the book Jaws, I think you can see that it took a lot of inspiration here. But this plot is not actually, I would say, the main event of the novel. The plot takes a back seat to these parts of the book that I think are why people really dislike Moby Dick, why Moby Dick is constantly described as dry. Uh, there are so many tangents in this book and chapters entirely dedicated to different aspects of whaling, different aspects of the ships, different aspects of whales as a species, uh, that you do feel like the plot gets lost a little bit in all of these tangents. But I will tell you that for me personally, the tangents are what made this book brilliant. I don't think I would have loved this book had it just been this straightforward revenge mission against this whale. Everything about these tangents makes the final kind of engagement or battle with Moby Dick, it makes it feel earned. You're ready for it by the time it gets there. Because you have taken so much time throughout the rest of the book to learn in particular about whales and specifically the sperm whale, which Moby Dick is, you really understand not only the men in this situation, but you understand Moby Dick. And so the confrontation between them is so much more heightened. There's so much more tension to it because you have an understanding of the whales now. And I think this book is really, really brilliant because it discusses whales in almost reverent terms. Herman Melville clearly views the whales almost on a level with humans and he affords them the same level of respect. And so there's a really interesting discussion around whether or not 
they actually should be killing these whales. And I think I'll read you one of my favorite quotes from the book uh, that is happening when they are actually killing a whale. Uh, and it's really gruesome. All of the aspects about whaling are really gruesome. I would warn you about that. But I think it's important to acknowledge that this is something that actually happened. And this is how whaling really was. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange misgrown masses gather in the knot holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied, now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see, but pity there was none. For all his old age and his one arm and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered in order to light the gay bridles and other merry makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. I think Moby Dick also has the connotation of glorifying whaling because so much attention is paid to describing it. Uh, but that part to me is particularly gruesome. It's very hard to read, but I think it shows that there is an understanding that what whaling was doing was horrific. And I just think it's so unspeakably sad to picture the whale. There's a lot of really wonderful imagery in this that feels as though you were watching a film. You can very easily visualize some of what he's telling you. And the death of that whale is one of those situations where you can just very easily picture everything that has just happened. But that's largely where I would say the majority of the criticism comes in, is that people really do think there are too many of these tangents. And I think quite famously, Moby Dick did not sell well when it was initially published, largely because of this. It's a very strange book. The book is written very oddly. Alongside these tangents about whales and learning about ships and the whaling business, uh, there's also just a really interesting element to the writing style where Ishmael, who is telling you the story, does directly address you as the reader. So there are quite a few parts of the book that are in second person that I think make it very eerie and really do involve you in the story, but I can imagine were a very hard sell for people at the time. And I think Moby Dick tragically sold something like only 3,000 copies initially, and it didn't become big until after Herman Melville's death. And some of that, I would imagine, has to do with the fact that whaling as an industry has died. And so there's a level of fascination around Moby Dick because it preserves a way of life that we no longer have any concept of. And so this book is really fascinating because you learn a lot about a way of life that is gone, but you also learn a lot about the whales. And I think there's so much introspection in analyzing the whales and analyzing how whales uh, breathe. There's a lot of conversation about the fact that whales can't be fish because they uh, breathe through their spout, uh, which I think is really, really interesting and is why Ishmael or Herman Melville won because you're often unsure in some places to me. Some of the tangents feel like they're coming from the author and not from Ishmael, but this is why I think whales are elevated to a certain extent to be alongside men. Uh, and I think this also is a good segue into perhaps my favorite aspect of this book. So much about this book revolves around the sea and describes the sea so brilliantly, how its calmness can hide such dangers within its depths, uh, the color of it, how the ocean kind of calls to you when you've been away from it for a long time or when you feel lost. Uh, you know that when you get back to the ocean, you'll feel found again. And that's kind of how the book starts off. And I knew that I would love it when I heard Ishmael talk uh, a little bit about the hold that the ocean has on us as people. This is from essentially the second page of the book. Uh, and so this is him basically talking about water and why would you want to visit anywhere that doesn't have any kind of water and why water uh, kind of calls to people, particularly the sea. Why upon your first voyage as a passenger did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity and own brother of Jove? Surely all this is not without meaning. And still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who because he could not grasp the tormenting mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. 
It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. That's essentially when I knew I was in love and there was gonna be no turning back. But that favorite element I was talking about uh, is that there's kind of a duality of description here. So for the first 100 pages, they are on land and getting ready to embark on the voyage. And everything on land is described in nautical terms, is described as something that might be at sea. Everything is given a ship analog. Uh, everything is described as something that might occur if you were out at sea. Uh, my favorite instance was when they go to church. They go to church once and the preacher gets up on the pulpit high above it and it's described as though uh, he is the captain of a ship. Everyone in the church is on the ship uh, and then it kind of parallels the fact that mankind is on a ship journeying through life and God should be the captain. And so even the sermon takes on an element of kind of nautical imagery. But as soon as they get out to sea and they start encountering whales uh, and whales start being discussed in these really long tangents that irritate a lot of people, the whales are almost always given human characteristics. They are almost always described in human terms. Uh, one instance I really remember is he would describe different types of whales. And in that chapter, he often called whales gentlemen. Another of my favorite quotes comes in this chapter where he's talking about different types of whales. In particular here, he is discussing the orca or the killer whale. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctiveness, for we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonapartes and sharks included. I understand why the tangents hold a lot of people up and why they make Moby Dick a difficult book to read especially if you were not really interested in the minutiae of whales. Uh, but that is something I will say, and I think it added to my enjoyment of the book, is I reached a point around the halfway mark and I was getting frustrated with these tangents and the fact that the plot was not really moving because he wanted to focus so much on everything about the whales, on how the whales' eyes were shaped, why their tails are horizontal, how they swim. And you're thinking to yourself, does this really have anything to do with the revenge of Captain Ahab on Moby Dick? Does this have anything to do with Ishmael and Queequeg's friendship? And it does, but it's in a very roundabout way uh, because in so many ways, all of this adds up so that the last half of the book is really filled with tension in my opinion. But I came to the conclusion during my frustration in all of this that to Herman Melville, this book is not really about Moby Dick. It's not really about the revenge story. To Herman Melville, this book is just about whales. This book is about whales in all of their different forms. It is about whaling as an industry. It is about preserving a way of life. This book is really about getting an education on whales, essentially, rather than truly the actual story of Moby Dick. And I learned after reading this that the book was initially published under the name of The Whale. And I think that that actually might have helped it in retrospect if it had kept that title. Because the whale can refer to kind of any whale. Moby Dick refers specifically to the white whale, to the sperm whale that they're hunting. But in so many ways, this book is not about Moby Dick specifically. It is about all whales. And to me, that's where the magic of the book is. And once I understood that, I really enjoyed it for what it is. I understood what Herman Melville was doing. And thus I felt like actually there has been no wasted time. None of these tangents were a waste because to Herman Melville, what he wanted to do, the point he wanted to get across, he got across quite brilliantly. You come away from this book understanding that men are just as much monsters as anything in the ocean. And you also come away from it thinking that whales are as deserving of respect and understanding as any other human being. And I think this book is just so brilliant in terms of this concept of man versus nature, because the first hundred pages, there is a lot of kind of misunderstanding between Ishmael and Queequeg. Queequeg's culture and religion are very different to Ishmael's and Ishmael doesn't understand it and some aspects doesn't want to understand it uh, and kind of mistreats him and babies him because he thinks, oh, you poor soul, you don't really understand what's going on here and you have to kind of give Queequeg leeway. And in some aspects, you often think Queequeg leads him on a little bit and tells him, yeah, we do all this crazy stuff 
which is probably not true. And so there is an element of kind of them not understanding each other's cultures and coming across very offensively to one another. And then as we get on board the ship and we meet the crew, uh, there's a lot of competition between people from Nantucket, people from Martha's Vineyard, people from Cape Cod. And so there's kind of a regional rivalry going on. But as soon as they enter the real realm of whaling, all of that falls by the wayside because it's suddenly more important to survive uh, than to criticize other people. It becomes less about what makes you different from your fellow man than what makes you different from that whale. And I think saying that the book is about whales gives you the impression that the characters don't have very much to do, but it's not true. The characters are really quite brilliant. Ishmael in particular is really incredible and really introspective. And he does things that you don't like, especially in his conversations with Queequeg early on. You think he's a little bit dense and definitely offensive, but he is a character that really grows on you. And I think Ahab in particular, Ahab being perhaps the most famous character from Moby Dick, aside from the whale, uh, he is a really fascinating figure because he's very interestingly characterized. And so he has a very distinctive way of speaking because he is characterized as somebody from a Quaker background. And so he still uses thee and thou uh, in his conversation. And so there is a Shakespearean element to Ahab that is not replicated in any of the other characters that really makes Ahab's revenge and vengeance quest with Moby Dick, it makes it take on a real Shakespearean element, which makes the book just absolutely brilliant in my opinion. There are so few weak spots here. I understand definitely that Moby Dick will not work for everybody. I think you have to have kind of a patience with it. I think you have to want to learn everything that he wants to tell you about whales. But in some ways, reading all of the whale chapters, reading everything up to the point where they have this major confrontation with Moby Dick, in some ways, that's more enjoyable and that's more important than that confrontation with Moby Dick. Uh, and so this is a very convoluted book. It's very strange. And I do think it won't work well for everybody, but I do think you should give it a shot. It is truly extremely brilliantly written. And that is a point of confusion for me in terms of the criticism. I understand criticism of all of the chapters on whaling and ships, but I don't understand the criticism that his writing itself is dry and boring uh, because I do think he has a lot of really introspective and philosophical discussion of whaling and of whales themselves. And I just think that his language, his mastery of language is absolutely incredible. Truly, I would have to say, and I'm going to give this book incredibly high praise, I think this might be my favorite book of the year. And I will say that I not only think it is my favorite book of the year, I think it is one of the best books that has ever been written. This is a truly spectacular feat. It is a genuinely wonderful reading experience. And I'm sad that the book has gotten a bad rap over the years because I actually experienced with this book something that I can say rarely happens for me, uh, which is that I finished it, I read the last line, which is brilliant. I read that last line and I automatically wanted to go back to the first page and read it again. Uh, if you have not read this yet, what a treat, uh, because I almost wish, even just having read it, I almost wish I could wipe it from my brain and read it for the first time again. It's just, really, really a beautiful, beautiful book uh, and an ode to whales, an ode to nature, and an ode to the ocean. And I think if you are somebody who really feels close to the sea, who spent a lot of time around the sea, uh, and who's always felt that calling for the ocean, uh, I think this book will speak to you. This was just an extremely special reading experience, and I would love to know down below if you have read Moby Dick, if you hated it, or if you loved it. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.